pass the people, can't pass the hit me. The 1960s had seen an increasingly violent tide of rioting sweep through major American cities, spurred on by principally deep-seated racial tensions, socio-economic disparity, police brutality and the Vietnam War. Beginning with the Harlem riots of July 1964, which caused damage of what would today be $5 million, killed four people and injured a hundred, the pattern of unrest spread. The Watts riots of August 1965 did $350 million worth of damage and killed 34. In 1967, the Newark riots were followed almost immediately by the devastating Detroit riot, which killed 26 and 43 people respectively and caused half a billion dollars worth of property damage. On the 4th of April 1968, the great Martin Luther King was murdered in Memphis. This outrage, this perfidy, set alight the rage of black communities across the United States, resulting in large-scale riots the like of which, both in their intensity and number, had only been barely glimpsed before. Chicago, Detroit again, and Baltimore all burned, along with many other cities as anguish ran through the communities. Some cities, like Detroit and Baltimore, never recovered. The subsequent desertion of these centres by the business and middle-class tax base, fleeing to the suburbs or generally less volatile environments, started the long-term decline of these once great cities. In 1967, Detroit and Baltimore were both the fifth and sixth biggest cities in the US. Fifty years on, they're the 26th and 23rd, respectively. Boston was on the night of April the 5th, a city cowering for the blow. Incidents and running battles had been escalating in the Roxbury section throughout the day. Kevin White, the city's 38-year-old mayor who'd been elected the previous year after a brutal election on the platform of desegregation, was preparing for a rough night. Not least of his problems was the James Brown. Hey, wait a minute, hold on here! The most popular soul music star in the country had a huge concert schedule for that evening at the Boston Garden. The chief of police was naturally concerned that if 15,000 people gathered together in one place decided they were going to riot, there was no way on God's green earth the police force could contain them. On the other hand, Tom Atkins from the NAACP, who knew Brown, suggested that 15,000 people turning up and finding out the concert had been cancelled was a guaranteed incitement to riot. His plan was to talk to Brown and convince him to allow the show to be televised live and also taped so it could be continually replayed to encourage people to stay at home. Arrangements were made with a local public access station, WGBH, to broadcast the concert. All that needed to be arranged was to convince the notoriously irascible Brown to do the show. Atkins headed out to Boston Airport to meet Brown and lay the plan on him. Now... James Brown prided himself on being an ambassador and a role model for black people and representing their aspiration within the American system. He was also a personal friend of Dr. King, but he was also a canny businessman. He let Atkins know that to broadcast his show for free would mean a loss of $60,000 due to the fact that he'd already signed an agreement to televise another concert and that agreement had a no complete clause and he had payroll to make and he had costs to cover, much as he would have wanted to help. Tom Atkins knew that Brown wasn't going to take a loss on that gig. Atkins explained the situation to White, who then, at considerable risk to his shaky position as mayor, guaranteed the 60000 for Brown. Now all that remained was to wait out the day and hope that the peace held. The Boston Garden, the venue for the concert, was a formidable place for such a gig to take place. Designated as a boxing ring, the stadium was incredibly intimate, intended to provide an experience where the crowd could, in the words of the architect, see the drops on the sweat of the boxer's brow. The Beatles played there in 1964 and Elvis Presley later played his only ever Boston show there in 1971. It was also the first venue The Who played after the Cincinnati disaster, which saw Pete Townsend scream obscenities at the crowd after some idiot threw a firecracker on stage. The first inkling the mayor had the plan was working was that when Brown stepped on stage that night, there were a mere 2,000 souls in the arena. Brown's band, which had such legends as Fred Wesley, Maceo Parker, Sinclair Pinckney, Jimmy Nolan, Bernard Oda, the mighty Clyde Stuberfield and Bobby Bird, and half a dozen others, featuring vocalist Marva Whitney, took the stage in front of the reduced but still fractious and edgy crowd, and the show began with the warm-up vamps and skits. However, after about two minutes, Brown, dressed in a cream-coloured three-piece suit, came out to the stage, 
perched on a stool and sang the sentimental ballad, If I Ruled the World. The crowd hushed as he sang, and Brown was seemingly oblivious to them, pouring everything into the song. Brown had recorded the song as the B-side of his big hit, I Got the Feelin'. When he finished, he began to talk, first about how grateful he was to the community for helping him out of poverty in Augusta, telling the story of how he started shining shoes on the stairs of the radio station for three cents a shine, working up to five and finally six cents a shine. He started shining shoes on the stairs, he said, and now he owned the radio station. He went on to talk about his friend, Dr. King. Brown felt it was important for people to honour his legacy through non-violence. He went on to praise Tom Atkins and Mayor White, and introduced Atkins, who sat on the stool that Brown had vacated, saying of Brown, he told me that I can sit in his seat, that I know I can't stand in his shoes. Brown concluded with his hope that people would go home from the show, watch it again on TV, then get up and go to school tomorrow. After a moving speech from Mayor White, the show began. I think I'm safe in saying there are few sights in the experience of not just popular culture, but, well, anything, really, than seeing James Brown in full flight. By Kansas City, two numbers in, Brown is that combination of spastic twitching, animal prance and fluid motion that he was legend for. As the band plunges into the groove, he locks in sync with Bernie Odom's bass and reels off the sideways, wonderful shuffle we know as James Brown. His fingers explode like sparks from pumping firecracker fists, flicking in the light and signaling the band. The MC, Danny Rainer, who worked for Brown for over 30 years, takes the mic. James Brown, Mr. Dynamite, the hardest working man in show business. James Brown, as Brown leaves the stage. Keep in mind, James Brown will be back. Brown was never and in concert performer as such. He tended to work with a review, and this show was no exception. Accordingly, Bobby Bird took over, with Brown returning for a duet on You've Got to Change Your Mind, giving shout-outs to Otis Redding himself, doomed to die before that year was out. Solomon Burke and Sam and Day, before Bird then ran through a set of soul standards, the highlight being a breakneck version of Sweet Soul Music, with, with Jimmy Chicken Scratch Nolan writing his signature guitar all over it. Brown returned for It's a Man's 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 World, working the crowd into a frantic ecstasy with his long improvised rap at the end, including two devastating knee drops, one at the 10 minute mark and one just before the lights blacked out at the end of his set, before Danny Ray appeared in the moonlight. Mr. James Brown, captivating audiences around the world. James Brown, keep in mind, James Brown will be back. And now ladies and gentlemen, it's showtime. Thus, the stage was set for Brown's storming finale. Parker takes the mic. Right now, everybody, it's showtime. Introducing the young man who you chose to be soul brother number one. The man who sings, try me. Prisoner of love. Papa's got a brand new bag. I break out in a cold sweat. Get it together. I can't stand myself. There was a time and his very latest release. I got that feeling. He is the boss of the world famous, famous flames, Mr. Please, Please, Please himself, James Brown. Brown hits the stage at a run and the band slams into a frantic version of Get It Together. Brown screaming, squealing and hollering as Bernie Odom's bass pumps a runaway train of hustle and Clyde Stuberfield whacks his awesome voodoo boogaloo on drums. Brown hollers, Maceo, uh, won't you blow? As Brown surrenders himself to whatever manic ecstasy is inhabiting, his feet flashing, legs pumping, and his body twitching and jerking like he was strapped into an electric chair. He shouts out to Nolan, Jimmy, give me a little Wes Montgomery. And Nolan reels off a jazzy solo, almost on a whim, and as the band were preternaturally attuned to Brown's will, the band snaps into There Was A Time. Brown is now a literal dervish sliding across the stage doing the camel walk. He did the mashed potato. He did that indescribable thing that where he stands on one leg and shuffles across the floor in almost a glide. The dance we know merely as the James Brown. How does he do all this? How does he command control in the midst of what in the lesser hands would be chaos? No one can say beyond he does it because he is James Brown. How did James Brown come about? It's the classic ontological recursion. In order for there to be James Brown, you must first be James Brown. As he dances, his face is a mask of iron concentration. His movements are tight, precise, and he keeps himself very compact. That's the difference between him and a young Michael Jackson. 
Jackson took Brown's footwork but applied it to his sense of wanting to expand into the space around him to test the furthest extensions of his body, arms flying akimbo and legs kicked it out. Jackson was Fred Astaire to Brown's Gene Kelly. With Jackson, you always sensed something extraordinary and risky was happening. James Brown was the Marlon Brando of soul. They both acted by the accumulation of gesture. Brown's stage act is just a procession of tiny acts accumulated over thousands of nights of course, they were allied to a band that he was relentless and often ruthless and cruel in building up to perfection. And this is demonstrated when, seemingly out of nowhere, they fashion another change from there was a time to I got the feeling. Brown, with his back turned to the crowd, hunched over the microphone. Before snapping back around on the beat, his pinky ring catching the spotlight and flashing ostentatiously. Brown rocks the mic stand back and forth, snapping it as he performs three perfect spins, the stand swinging precipitously as if it has a mind of its own, being right back in place for Brown's hand as the third spin completes. Try Me brings squeals of delight from the audience and no doubt a welcome relief from the punishing pace of the last 20 minutes for the band. Brown, hemmed in by the twin saxophones of Maceo Parker and Sinclair Pinckney, shuffled and weaved like a boxer. The band slams into cold sweat. The guy working the spotlight is earning his money, tracking a wheeling and sliding Brown as he spins away from the mic. Nolan's guitar here is a metronomic wonder. Parker's sax solo is punchy and inventive. Stuberfield's drumming, which virtually invented funk on the original recording of this, is urgent, insistent and invariably brilliant. And his solo raises a roar from the crowd. By the time Brown reaches I Feel Good, the crowd has surged forward to the stage and is reaching out for him. I Got You segues into Please, Please, Please and the crowd surge again. Brown drops to his knees as Danny Ray drapes the spangled cape over him and leads him stage right. As always, Brown shakes it off and back and returns to the mic, more fervent than ever as the ritual is repeated. The crowd is in the throes of some high febrile mania. A different cape is offered and thrown off again. Brown flails maniacally. The mic stand rocks to and fro and from, and in a single gesture, Brown catches it, does a half spin and drops to his knees. A third cape comes out and Bird walks Brown off, who this time takes a deep bow as if to make his exit. But when Brown crosses back to center stage, a kid has jumped up there with him and cops appear from nowhere. There's a moment of pandemonium where the whole thing could explode. The kid is dispatched from the stage by Brown's people, not the cops. The band does not miss a beat. This is the critical moment. Brown, still trying to carry on with the show, looks confused. There are leather-jacketed cops on stage. Tom Atkins is there. Please, please don't go, is the unstinting refrain from the backup singers. You can feel the tension even now watching it. 50 plus years later, everything comes down to what happens next. Brown, now aware of the extraordinary goings-on around him, holds an arm to gesture the cops to leave and walks back to the mic stand right in front of the most frenzied section of the crowd. He clutches the stand and takes a long, deep bow. The band thumps on and the audience screams over the top of it. He bends down to exchange a few words with one fan and then, with a chop of his hand, the band drops on the beat into I Can't Stand Myself. The kid who got up on the stage previously tries again. This time, a cop shoves him off hard and he lands back in the crowd. Things are about to get ugly. But then Brown does something incredible. He stops the show. He tells the police officers to leave the stage. Move on, I'll be all right. I'll be fine. A very young boy leaps up on stage. Brown looks at him, smiles and says, what are you going to do? You want to dance? Soon there's maybe 10 people on stage, black and white, shaking Brown's hand, patting his shoulder. A cop moves in. Brown catches him. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They're all right, they're all right. And the cop backs off without issue. More people pour onto the stage and envelop Brown. Hold on, hold on, he cried. Let me finish a show. Go down now, go down, fellas. Let me finish a show. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? This is no way. We are black. Can't we get through this show together? Don't make us all look bad. Step down, be a gentleman. Wait a minute. Young man, why are you up here? Do you wanna, don't you want to dance? Well, go back down and let me do the show. The kid told Brown he wanted to shake his hand and Brown shook it. You guys are making me look very bad. I'm going to ask the police to step back, which they did. You're not being fair to yourself or me either or all of our race. Now, I ask the police to step back because I think I can get some respect from my own people. Now, we are together here. The crowd now back in their seats roared back in the affirmative. Brown turned back to Bobby Bird. Good to 
Three minutes later, after another quick burst of cold sweat, it's over. Brown, the knees of his pants white from where he hit the stage so often and drenched with sweat, is gone. Two days later, he and the band would be playing the Maple Leaf Gardens in Montreal. Boston was spared any serious damage from the riots, due largely to the concert being played continuously on television through the rest of the night. Tom Atkins went on to a successful career in the NAACP, politics and the law, although he wasn't successful in running for mayor against Kevin White in 1971. Kevin White served as mayor of Boston until 1984, when he declined to seek re-election for another term, dying at 83 in 2012. James Brown went on to cement his legend through the rest of the 60s and the pre-disco 70s before emerging again in the late 80s with more contemporary work. And that legend is enormous. He is one of the genuine titans who hold up all of American popular music and all of those who seek to ape its forms. He is the pulse, the thrust, the underlying beat of all black music forms that came after him. As he said in his autobiography, I taught them everything they know but I didn't teach them everything I know. Mind-bogglingly, Brown had more US Top 40 hits than Elvis, The Beatles, or Madonna. Never had a number one, but he did have 17 R&B chart toppers. Now, let's not make a saint of him. Brown was a tyrant and a cruel and a flawed man in his professional and private life. A man with a compulsive fixation on control and, like many great performers, oblivious to his shortcomings. His downfall was precipitous. After his son Teddy was killed in a car wreck in 1973, Brown became even more obsessive as the new generation of black music stars started to surpass him and he seemed to lack the focus and the energy that he once had, slipping into irrelevance for a decade. There was a comeback of sorts, but it was an audience paying to see a legend, not an artist in his prime. It was all too sad in the end, but all ends are sad. However, in a career which defined musical immortality, the events of April 5th, 1968, would shine out as perhaps the greatest moment of them all.